Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and today I'm going to teach you how to debug like a boss. It's cool enough that I think you'll find it compelling even if, like myself, you don't really do any Raspberry Pi coding anyway. Check it out because it's handy and elegant enough that it just might prompt you to start Pi hacking. And if you already do code for the Pi, well, I'm going to change your life. What is it? I'm going to show you how you can do what you already know how to love and do, like single stepping through your C++ code in Visual Studio, but how to do it remotely on a Raspberry Pi running a Raspbian, without ever touching the Pi. We'll blink an LED and watch it turn off and on at the Pi visually every time we hit F5 in Visual Studio. Because better yet, we'll be working entirely on the desktop PC with no physical connection to the Pi whatsoever, as it all takes place magically over the network using SSH. And everything we'll do today is a shipping part of the existing free Visual Studio Community Edition product. It's just not very well known. We're going to fix that today because I'll show you precisely how to enable it and how to get it going. Stay tuned to watch me single-step Linux code running on a Raspberry Pi within Visual Studio as if it were local on the PC itself. There's no excuse for printf-style debugging anymore. You might be wondering what the heck I'm doing making an episode about the Pi. After all, most of my electronics projects are based around the ESP32, and I haven't really run into a situation yet where I needed more horsepower than its dual 240MHz cores could provide, so Jeff Gearling can sleep easy for another day. Recently, however, I picked up a Pi Zero, these tiny little boards that are ever so adorable and cute. Probably can't focus on it at this distance, but, well, if it's at the same focal plane as me, you could, but then it's really small. Anyway... It's not really any larger than an ESP32 DIP module, but it's still rocking a full single board computer. A living, breathing, Linux running computer with USB and HDMI ports. Like an idiot, I accidentally ordered a batch without Wi-Fi before I figured out that I really needed the W version, so at least get the W version if you get it so you get the Wi-Fi. This all started with a simple question. If I take a brand new Pi out of the box, like this, what code do I need and how complex is it to simply turn off and on a GPIO pin like an LED? If I want to do that ultimate basic test, simply blinking an LED, that's got to be really simple, right? It's probably in the Hello World sample even, I bet. Well, apparently, not so much. While to you and me, turning an I.O. port off and on might seem very basic because we're used to doing it on microcontrollers, it's more complicated than that on a full single board computer. I thought perhaps maybe it'd be something like an out instruction or something, but I wasn't so lucky. Fortunately, even if it's not easy in theory, it's in practice simplified by the availability of a library called Wiring Pi. Wiring Pi does all the dirty work of making sure the CPU and the I.O. and the port registers and the interrupts and everything else are all properly aligned, and then it lets you control the pins with simple commands similar to what you might have been used to from the Arduino SDK, like pin mode and digital write, digital read, that sort of thing. There might be a fair bit of complexity going on under the covers, but in your code, it's all straightforward. Wiring Pi seems to have had an interesting life. The original author seems to have become frustrated and quit in protest, but you can't take the ball and go home when the ball has already been open sourced. The ball, or the project that is, has been forked innumerable times and I'll provide you a link to what seems to be a reliable copy in the video description. The first thing we need to do is to prepare the Pi itself, which is fortunately pretty simple. Just take your favorite raspy image and bring it up on the Pi. Now, when I said you never need to touch the Pi, if your image has Wi-Fi and everything enabled, that is true. Otherwise, you need to use Raspi to make, to make sure that the Wi-Fi is enabled or that you plug in a network cable so you've got an IP address, and then enable SSH so you can get into the Pi. After that point, it's all hands off. Make sure that works and that you can log in remotely via SSH before going any further. Basically, we need to get the Pi updated to the point where it has the compilers, tools, and headers needed to compile our project on the Pi side, even though we'll never be doing that manually. Because what I believe the system does is to actually deploy the source code and compile and link it on the Pi, rather than cross-compiling the binary on the PC. It may do both, for all I know, but it all happens behind the scenes, and that means the system needs to be capable of it. The first thing we'll do is to sudo apt update in order to update the list of available software on the Pi, its internal database of software packages and dependencies. When that completes, we'll then run sudo apt upgrade to make sure that whatever packages are already installed on this machine are currently fully updated. With the updates complete, we can add the pieces that we need. I'll give you a full list in the video description, but that's really all you need to do. Turn on Wi-Fi, turn on SSH, and turn on the tools, or install the tools. Set the host name and walk away. Well, almost. There's one catch, but I figured it out and it'll be easy. 
Wasn't easy for me, though. It was really ugly. Wiring Pi seems to need admin rights to actually even initialize, let alone touch any of the ports. Now, I don't want to grant admin rights to every program that I write, so I opted to create a group and grant that group hardware access to the GPIO pins. I then place my account in that group, and everything works magically. It means I don't need to run my own app with sudo, which would be annoying. Those steps are also in the video description, and if you find your app faulting or exiting when you use Wiring Pi or touch a pin, that's almost certainly what's going on. As noted earlier, I'd recommend you SSH into the Pi at least once manually just to make sure that much works. If you have any trouble whatsoever, make sure that's working first. I can't stress that enough. Have I mentioned it yet? Good. With the Pi ready, we can turn our attention to the Windows PC itself. Of course, we need to have Visual Studio installed, and I'm using the free Community Edition. More specifically, though, we need the Unix development workflow installed. If you're installing Visual Studio for the first time, you can simply select it as one of the options. But if you've already had Visual Studio installed and you just want to go back and add the Linux packages now, you can simply rerun the Visual Studio installer, which will still be available on your start menu somewhere. Select the option to make changes to your installation. Scroll down through the list until you find the Linux workflow and select it before clicking Apply Changes. Let it turn away and download as needed for a while and it will add the Linux cross-compilation support to your system. This will allow you to cross-compile and deploy and debug Linux apps running in the WSL subsystem as well, but we're going to go a step further and connect it to a remote Raspbian instance on the Pi rather than the local WSL install. For the next steps, I'm going to drop into OBS Studio, and just like Bill O'Reilly, we'll do it live and I'll show you how it all works. Okay, I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to do this section of the show or this segment of the show live, and I'm not going to script it. I'm just going to load up Visual Studio, and I'm going to go through the steps that you need to set up in order to get this type of debugging working. And then I'm just going to test it, demo it, show you that it works, enter some code, single step through it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, you'll know we're in OBS Studio, or at least I will be when this is live up here on the screen, this awesome semi-transparent logo that I stuck up there. Uh, and also... When I hit that, nothing happens because I didn't have the cursor in the right place. But if I click on this, you'll get Visual Studio. And if I do this, you'll get us both at once. So that's how I'm going to largely operate for the next little bit. What we need to do first is to just create a new blank project in Visual Studio. And I'll show you the type we need to do. So simply do File New, Project. We're going to do Console Application. We're going to make sure we pick C++, Linux, and Console. Now, if your options below that, don't pick CMake, the top option. Pick Console Application. Click Next, and we'll give it a name. I Linux Test, something like that. Uh, keep the default of placing the solution in the current folder, because it's a really simple project. Now, when this comes up, you'll get a uh, Getting Started page, which has a bunch of helpful information on debugging and working through Linux. Uh, we're not going to look at that right now, so I'm going to close that, and I'm going to zoom in here so we can see this font a little better. Now, the first thing you should do, because I always burn myself this way, is come in and change to ARM64 right away. Otherwise, you're going to make a ton of changes to your build setting environment, and they're all going to apply to x64, and then you're going to realize that none of it took any effect, and then you'll remember which ones did I change already. It's a mess, so make that the first thing you do. It's ARM64 because I'm on a Pi 4. I've never tried this on a Pi 3B, but if you did, then you weren't running 64-bit, then you could probably just do ARM. But Pi 4, 64-bit, uh, Ubuntu, Raspbian, whatever the hell's on there, and uh, or Debian, I guess. Now, in order for it to actually properly find the wiring Pi library, we have to tell it where it's installed on this local machine. Uh, and so we'll do that in the VC include directory setting. The other thing we need to do is in the linker input, tell it that we're going to include wiring pi. It's not normally how I do my uh, build dependencies in Visual Studio, but that will work to get the dependency through to the build, the build environment that's going to do its work under Linux. It will basically add dash L wiring pi as a linker option to GCC. Uh, if you're curious about how it's getting compiled, we actually have a couple of options here. So I'm using GCC for remote Linux. You can also switch to CLang. I have no idea. I've never tried this before. Let's try it live. That's always advisable. Let's try building it now with CLang once it's done chewing away here. Do I want to stop debugging? Yeah, I'll stop debugging the old one first. All right, it compiled. And it did a remote build. I'm going to step into it with CLang and see how that works. 
well, my goodness, it works. And I'm gonna go back and change it to GCC just because I know that works for my purposes when I go to deploy it and blink the LED. One of the first things we need to do is indicate that we're gonna use the standard namespace. Why? Because later I'm gonna use a string, but probably not even today. All right. So let's put out some status here because one thing you'll run into is that as soon as you call anything in wiring pi, it blows up, stops, exits, your program is done. And that's because it lacks the corrected min rights to even touch the IO ports under the dev folder, which is how they're exposed. So what we need to do later is we'll run and we'll create a group on Linux and say that group has access to that pin, basically, or to those pins. And that will solve that problem without us having to run sudo or get this always running under um, administrative powers. So that will set up the wiring pi library and it will turn pin 23 to be an output pin. All right, what this is gonna do is gonna forever in a while one loop that's going to write out to pin 23 the opposite of whatever pin 23 currently is. So it's gonna take digital read of pin 23, invert that value and write it back to pin 23. It's gonna flash the LED. And how often is it gonna do it? Well, we're gonna delay 100 milliseconds, so it's gonna do it 10 times a second. Let's see how it works. First, let's build it. All right, compile first time, Dave. Good job. Deploy, step into, run. Setting up wiring pie already. Look at that. And my LED is even flashing. What more could you ask for? It's blinking. It's blinking, I promise you. So the next thing I want to do is to make sure that I can access the GPIO pins on the Pi without it faulting, because I've actually already done that, and that's why it worked. Then I forgot to undo it when I tested it, and then I realized, oh, this shouldn't have worked. So let me show you why it worked and what you need to do to make it work. First, we need a console window on your Pi, so SSH into your Pi. I have one handy here, or I will in a second. If you're curious what 64 cores looks like on HTOP, let's take a look. Not much room for anything else besides the cores. I think that's kind of cute. Eh, and I, I know those guys with 128 cores and they could flex on me and it would look even cooler, but hey. So here's the steps that you'll want to do to your Pi in order to make it work. First thing we're going to do is we're just going to do SSH, copy ID, put my credentials on there. And it's called Pi4 in my case, whatever your Pi is called, who knows. And it is 4G01. I already existed because I've already done this, but it should work. So now if I SSH into that machine, which is my Pi, it just logs me in automatically because I've exchanged keys with it. So that's handy. Now, as I do these steps, it's probably going to say, hey, they've already been done in each case because they've already been done, but I'll show you the steps anyway. So we're going to create a new group called GPIO, and we're going to give this group access to the pins. So it already exists on my machine. We're going to use a user mod. We're going to add myself to the group. So it looks like me and Pi are members of the GPIO group. GPIO mem is the device in the dev folder that represents the GPIO pins. So what we're going to do is we're going to take ownership of those. And if we need to do anything else, oh, I should uh, change the permissions on them. Pseudo mod, pseudo ch mod. We're gonna give the group read and write. That's all we should need, I believe. One thing I'd like to add though, how big can a host name be? Is there like a size limit? Well, hope it's not any longer now. Gotta be a length parameter on this thing. I'm going to ask for the host name because I want to make sure that I'm actually running remotely. I don't want any chance to just fake me out here. Let's put a breakpoint right there. And I'll just click go. Hello from Pi 4 4G01. Exactly what we're hoping for. And it stopped at the breakpoint. That's the other cool part. So that's it. Now, if I single step through this code, sure enough, it blinks once per step. So every time I step over that line, the LED changes state. Pretty cool. 
not the LED flashing part, but the fact that I can single step through this code live, change the state of the hardware and watch the LED change color is together. Cool. That's what I'm saying. Yes, that is indeed what I'm saying. Wait, how did I know I was going to say that? That makes no sense. Now, maybe it's just me, but this is my favorite debugging setup that I've played with in quite a while because it takes what would otherwise be a grim environment, a text-based GDB session, and gives it the rich expression of a full Visual Studio debug experience. I didn't go through how to do watches and inspectors and so on because it's by and large exactly the same way you'd do it for a local project in Visual Studio, and that's precisely the point. It works in a way that's really easy to use and that you probably already know and understand. And it's been quite resilient for me as well, not one of those things that needs constant rebooting and reinstalling to stay functional. If there's any interest, I also managed to get a similar setup working for Visual Studio Code for the ESP32 microcontroller. If you'd like to debug the ESP32 like a boss as well, let me know in the video comments or by stopping by the Discord server to chat. Links for that are in the video description. Don't forget to grab yourself a Dave's Garage mug from the video description, and thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you. And a rocking chair for another who likes to rock. And a big armchair for two more to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.